this workshop uh, sort of grew out of my uh, analysis of the student course evaluations and the configurations of things that usually go together. And so um, there's some that just sort of uh, add up to, what the, the little pieces add up to classroom climate. What are you doing in your classroom that facilitates learning? And how do your, uh, how do your students perceive that? So I uh, asked the chairs actually to recommend faculty in their departments who would be good at doing this, who, who seem to have that down from their observations and from looking at their course evaluations. And they recommended um, Trevor and Lori. So I was very happy to have them on the agenda for this uh, semester. Lori is a member of the, of the science faculty and uh, Trevor is a member of the psychology faculty. So it, it looks like you're going first. Is that right? Well, we're kind of together. Oh, together. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. Um, yes. So definitely I don't feel like I'm um, the expert on anything. So uh, please jump in. Comments. Um, very much appreciated. Discussion would be great. Um, so the way um, Carolyn came, uh, gave us some, um, some of the topics she kind of wanted us to, to cover. So I'll just put these topics in. And here are just some ideas, and they're not mine. I've stolen them from people who've told me what worked in their classes. Um, and the first one is encourages open discussion. And I think Trevor and I both agree on this, and um, I'll move on to some of his slides here in just a second. But I think one of the most important things for open discussion is the atmosphere. Um, I feel like um, if the students feel comfortable with you um, and um, that you're not going to make fun of them or ridicule them um, for a comment that they say, then um, they're much more willing to open up and say things. Um, there's, I think that they feel that there's a vulnerability there if they say something that they could look dumb. Um, and I've got this on another slide too, probably because I feel like I've said a lot of dumb things in my life. So sometimes if I have a particular class that I feel like it will be helpful for them, if they've told me, oh, I don't want to ask this dumb question. I will sometimes tell them the stupid things that I've said in the past that <laughs> it's okay because listen to what I said. Yours can't be worse than this. Um, so I think sometimes that just makes them feel like we're human. I think sometimes they feel like we, I know I did as a student felt like um, these professors just knew everything and um, I don't feel like I'm that way now. Um, so I think sometimes they have that perspective. Um, and then I also think atmosphere includes how the classroom is set up. Um, so in certain situations, um, it's hard every class, but for specific activities, I will actually have them move the chairs um, and circle up. But I think Trevor has some really good um, comments here, so I want to go ahead and um, this goes along with what I said too. So let Trevor jump up. It's interesting, uh, the skill set that I bring to this. My, my PhD in clinical psychology gave me zero experience teaching, but a lot of experience doing psychotherapy. And so it's like, okay, uh, is this the therapist way of doing <laughs> teaching? I'm just kind of struggling with this with uh, Carolyn. But to be honest, everything I've put on here is something I've made a mistake with. I, I tried doing it kind of the opposite way to some degree, or I found out the hard way that this is really what works. So a, a couple things to kind of in creating this safe place. The first is, d don't ask initial questions that push students to a particular position. I made this mistake early on. You know, I sometimes use clickers in my classes, and so what I do is I ask them to take a position on some controversial issue at the very beginning, and then I would try to give them evidence with hope that it would change their mind toward the end. But by making them declare what their position is at the very beginning, they were less likely to change their mind. And so when I removed that question from the beginning, I had more success in kind of taking them through the process. So you immediately kind of create a team mentality where it's us against them. Even if none of the them are in the classroom, it still creates a dangerous team mentality that I think shuts down conversation. But to be honest, most of the time you have both within your classroom. So um, avoid that initial disclosure. It, it, even with the eye clickers, it was anonymous. They weren't raising their hands, staking out a position. Just cognitively coming to that own, own conclusion, this is my position, was enough to make it less likely that they would change their mind. Certainly, if they did it publicly, you know, with everyone that's for capital punishment, raise your hand or something, you know, that, that right away is going to create that kind of team mentality. So I, I think that's important. Um, 
avoid revealing your own position. And I think that's kind of intuitive. I think a lot of us do that, especially at the beginning of a conversation. Um, I certainly have strong opinions, and I don't tell people that I'm neutral about the issue. I have strong opinions, but I, I try not to actually reveal what that position is at the very beginning, and actually, as you'll see, even at the end. I think when there's a correct position, I, I want to see the class get to that conclusion via the work they do, rather than use my position as the teacher of telling them, okay, this is what you're supposed to think. So this kind of gets into the whole critical thinking component, which we'll talk about later. If anyone shows any disrespect, I'm very, very quick to, to shut that down. Um, and and I, I, I've been slow on this in the past, and I haven't been, I, I had an interesting situation not too long ago. We were discussing homosexuality in my big psych class with 200 people, and that's a challenge. And one student made a question. He said, well, um, when queers do this, I get really con confused, and I, I wonder about this, and something like that. And that was his language. And I responded to the content of his language without making a comment about the word that he used. That's a complex word, right? Because sometimes it can even be used in a self-referential way within an LGBT context. But it, it wasn't for, he wasn't using it that way. He was using it derogatory. And a lot of students were really angry at me for not calling him on it and let me know afterward by email. So to be very, very quick to intervene on the disrespect side, but not attacking the question or the questioner, but just the language that they chose to use. I, I think that's important. It kind of sets the standard for the classroom and creates that safe place for everybody. Now, yes, as you're going through this, I can see this happening in one of my classes. How would you address that in class? What would you say to the students? You know, that, that's a really great question. I, the language that you use, though, is language that I, I think some people will hear as hurtful. I'm not sure you meant it as hurtful, but I, I think a lot of people heard it that way. So let's find a different language that we could use to ask that same good question. Quickly intervene when people who are not in the room or positions that are not rep uh, represented are, are demonized or dehumanized. I think we're very, very quick to do that, particularly in this kind of polarized environment we are at the moment. It just seems like it's getting worse in some ways, but we have a tendency to, again, create that us-them type situation. And the more that we let them, uh, I, I will intervene any time that, that language is used to, rather, rather than substantially talk about the issue, it's, it's just an attack. And I, I call people on it, and I say, okay, I understand you've got strong feelings about that particular issue, but I'm not sure I heard what it is that you really wanted to say. I think, I think the language that you used interfered with the message. Let me hear what your message really is. So that's the kind of thing I'd say. Sarcasm, I got a list of there, uh, hyperbole, contempt, sarcasm, but I think sarcasm is the worst. Um, I, I sometimes tend toward it myself, and it is so destructive in these types of conversations. And even though you want to have the humor to get everyone to kind of relax, and I'm all for using humor in the midst of these discussions, I think that the sarcasm is so cutting, and it, it, it very quickly shuts people down. So when you use it, or if you see that someone in the class use it, I think that's important. So I call it out. I just name it what it is, even if I did it. If I did it by accident, okay. And I love giving that example. I just said something, it was probably kind of hurtful. And, you know, let me find a better way of saying it. It's okay. That's the vulnerability that Lori was talking about. I think that's part of it. Passion is allowed. I don't want to shut down the passion in the class, but, but respect is required. And so we're just trying to model civil discourse. Yeah. Oh, you were, I thought you were thinking about something. <laughs> okay. Thanks, well, what do you mean with passion? In, in, in what sense? You, you I, I think it's great that people feel strongly about the issue. I'm not trying to censor the strength of their, their conviction on the particular issue. I just want to challenge the language that they use to convey that passion. A lot of times, instead of saying what's really important to them, they use that energy to attack another person. And I just get them to reroute it and say, tell me what's really important to you. Use that passion to tell me why this is something that you want to fight for. Um, another area that I think, for me, is really hard because I feel like there's this set amount of material that I want to cover, so I need to trudge through it all, right? I need to make it all the way through. Um, and so sometimes I block an open discussion because I'm trying to make it through a certain amount of material. Um, so one of the things that I try to do is ask a lot of questions 
um, throughout the lecture. Um, sometimes that's to no avail, uh, maybe because I ask the question and give about a second and a half to respond. <laughs> um, so I'm still working on that myself. Um, and then another, it kind of goes to the atmosphere also. Um, so I know one of the things that we try to do and we've been taught um, through education courses is to make them active because they're more they're sitting passive. It's easy to um, kind of zone out. Um, one of the things that I will do sometimes is have them come to the board, but, um, and, and I have them pass the marker off and to their friends. But sometimes that's, and I know from my perspective as a student, to be called out and you don't know the answer, then you immediately feel, oh, I look stupid in front of the whole class, great. Um, so one of the things that I try to do is I give them the, oh, you can phone a friend. Um, and sometimes I'll say, I can be your friend um, and I can help you. Or I'll say, or we can pull the audience, kind of the um, who wants to be a millionaire um, attitude. And I think from that, with them knowing that it's not just them, they can get help that they're not gonna look um, stupid um, in front of the class. I think that sometimes helps with the discussions and they're, they're more open. Um, this next one is something that I took from my gateway class. I've had very diverse gateway classes over the years. This semester, I have a very engaging <coughs> gateway class. They're the kind that um, they will, they'll open up and they'll talk and sometimes you'll actually actually have to have them stop talking. Um, <laughs> but in many of the semesters, because um, I teach a science specific gateway, sometimes they just won't talk at all. And that's really hard to have a discussion when they won't say anything. So one of the things that we did is broke them up in small groups and it was so interesting because they would talk to each other in the small groups at length. And then when we bring them back to the large group, nobody would say anything. So we decided that it was more effective to keep them in the small groups and at least they're discussing with each other and then us kind of monitor the small groups and make sure they're on task. Um, but that was much more effective. But I think this is one that definitely goes with your class dynamic and you have to play with it a little bit and maybe combine them a little. Um, and, and I will say I, I cheated because I asked my student to help me with this and so <laughs> she gave me some comments too and one of the comments that she said was helpful for her and she was actually talking about Dr. Freak's class here is pr uh, accountability to prepare ahead of time. Um, so she was talking about discussions that they do over research articles and um, his accountability is to give a quiz and I do a similar thing in another class where we're gonna discuss scientific misconduct, but if I, I, when I first started doing it, there was no accountability. We were just gonna come in and discuss. Well, some of them would discuss, and the question I always had was, were they not discussing because they're, they didn't wanna say anything, or because they didn't read it so they don't have a perspective to discuss? So I, I changed it up and then they had to, so now they have to actually turn in a reflection of the article before, um, um, we actually discuss it, and that's been um, much more helpful. Um, but anyway, those, those little accountability um, areas help a lot. Um, and then, if you want to cover about. I, I made a mistake early on in that I had, I had an agenda. I, I thought, okay, I want to get them from thinking about this way on a particular topic to this way on a particular topic. And I, I geared everything toward that. And that was a mistake on a number of different levels. I, I didn't happen, I didn't let the, the conversation happen more organically. And so one thing I switched to was setting listening goals. Instead of having a specific outcome that I was going for, I had a goal that everyone in the class should be able to accurately and passionately articulate both sides of an issue as if it were their own position. I want them to get enough information from the dialogue that's going on. So again, I'm not trying to divide them up into teams of those who are for and against. I want each person to be able to articulate well. So if I called on someone randomly, I want you to pretend you're on this side of the issue, regardless of which side they're at. Just, just pretend that this is your issue and give me a passionate argument for why this is important. And their ability to articulate what's important to the other person is extremely helpful in creating that kind of dialogue. I'll actually model that. So as each person adds to the conversation, a standard thing that I do is I will restate what I think that I heard them say. This is a standard therapy technique. And I'll, I'll try to take it a little bit further. I'll go into a little bit more depth, add the information that I think makes the comment a little richer. But then I check back with them and said, 
is, is, is that what you were trying to say? Am I saying it right? So I'm giving kind of permission to modify what they're doing, and do they agree with that? And a lot of times they say, yeah, that, that's exactly it. And sometimes they say, no, um, I, I meant this. And say, okay, great. So, so again, I'm trying to make sure that they, I show that I heard what they said. And that's a great way for getting the students to start doing that to each other. So I'm modeling it for them as the conversation goes on. I also encourage everyone to contribute to both sides of the argument. So rather than having one group that's for, one group and against, that's, I think, one of the worst things that you can do. So if you've got your whole circle, okay, everyone that wants to take this position, get over here, talk amongst yourselves. It's almost like we did the debate club stuff back in high school, right? That, maybe that's great training for one sort of thing, but I, not for, I think, these kinds of productive conversations. I think it's much better to have people kind of scattered about. And, and anytime anyone offers something from either side, you know, we might be saying, okay, I want to hear all the pros, not from all the people that are for it, but even from the people that are against it. You know, all the pros of this particular position. Let's think this through. And I think that's helpful. At the end of the conversation, what, what I think we, another thing I, I think I've done wrong many times in the past is I, I have a tendency to explain what just happened, right? Let's talk about the conclusions that we can draw based on the conversations that we had together. But I, I think I shortcut the process. I think what happens is the people need to, that they've heard the other position articulated well for the first time in their life sometimes. And I think they need to sit on that. Knowing that the other side is human, knowing that the other side has strong feelings for good reasons about their positions, allow them to carefully consider not only the other position, but their own position. Why do I feel the way that I do? So for me to shortcut the process by giving them the answer at the end of the, the exercise, I think is a mistake. Um, what I do is I encourage people for doing the hard work of hearing and articulating the opposing position. I said, listen, I heard you guys say things today that, um, that you wouldn't have thought before you started this whole process. That's really valuable. Great job at doing that work. And I will even go so far, that's the next point, that if I have heard something new, sometimes even if I haven't, I'll find <laughs> something that I claim was new. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I model for them. If I hear something that I thought was novel, I will say, hey, I never considered that before. I really didn't. This was really valuable to me today. Thank you for doing it. Right? Again, model what it is that I'm wanting them to do. So I avoid the, co the closing comments that cause students to associate themselves to a particular outside group. I want them to focus on membership of the group that is the class. That's the big thing. I'm complimenting on their membership of being in this class struggling with this issue. That's the group I want them to be a part of, not the for group, not the against group. And when I give kind of a compliment to them for being a part of that group, I think I'm, I'm encouraging them to engage in the critical thinking process. Does anyone else have anything you want to share as far as open discussion, things that you've done in your class that were successful or maybe wasn't as successful as you wanted it to be? Yeah. In math class, we do a lot of um, like the think, pair, share. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, where they solve the problem and look with their buddy and they solve the problem together or talk about, you know, and that's helpful instead of just saying, who can explain this? Because then it goes quiet. Yeah, so. or one person mm -hmm. always. Yes, one person explain. always, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, that's good. Any others? I struggle with when I open up to discussion, uh, when I'm lecturing especially and bringing the question and answer and whatnot, uh, students have a tendency to confuse that the professor has an opinion with you're pushing that on. Like if I publish a lot, so there's stuff that I've researched a lot, so I have an opinion on something. But they sometimes m misconstrue that as being, well, he's closed. And so I'm not exactly sure how to overcome that when you're in a in a discussion like this, when you have you know the, the sides are discussing the issue, and of course they always turn to the professor. Well, what do you think? You're saying, Trevor, you're saying, don't say anything? No, or say both sides passionately. So, for example, um, I, I just in the Psych 200 class, I was asking people how many had watched the debate, the second debate, and um, we were, we were uh, actually my lecture for that day was why can't Republicans and Democrats get along? And I was looking at social psychology phenomena that were involved. And, and part, of, part of what I wanted to do was, you know, there, there's, there's a huge discrepancy about how Republicans are treating Trump's uh, um, 
2005 comments and how Democrats are treating that comment. And so I, I tried to articulate both sides passionately. I pretended I was a Republican and I said what some of the Republicans are saying. And then I pretended I was a Democrat and I said what some of the Democrats were saying. And I tried not to twist the argument. I tried to give it as each side authentically tries to give it, even though I strongly think one of them is really, really wrong, <laughs> right? But I put them both out there, and that, that gives us a great starting point, I think. It's, it's, it's when they see that I'm capable of stating both positions well, so much so that a Republican in the audience would go, yeah, and a Democrat in the, in the group would go, yeah, when I articulated that argument. I think that gets beyond the preconceptions that they put on me. There, I mean, I understand that concept. Within biblical studies and theological studies, there is orthodoxy yes. and there's heterodoxy. And so the, the issue is, you would, I'm assuming for me in a classroom, I would want my students to come down on the side of orthodoxy. And so if, they, if you present the two, the two sides, my, my wife has this issue when she teaches theology. <laughs> and she has Arianism and Athanasius. Right. And we have, she has students who will not take that other side. I, I, I can't be an area. You know, I can't do that. Right. Because he's a heretic. Yeah. And she's saying it's a discussion, and they won't do it. And because their thinking is I have to be orthodox. And so for me, when I'm teaching in a theological setting or a biblical setting, I'm wanting them to come to a conclusion that is orthodox. I, I feel strongly, and I say this to the class, I feel strongly that you cannot change someone else's position unless you thoroughly understand why they take that position. So if you cannot articulate it to the same passion and extent that they can, there's no way that you're going to connect with it. There's no way that you can understand it from their perspective, and you're not going to be able to move them. So I think an important part of bringing people into orthodoxy is to understand completely where the other side is coming from. So it's a, I think it's an important exercise. I, I know that's hard to get them to do, but I'd still say, do you want to be an evangelist or not? <laughs> if you do, you have to be able to see things from that other perspective. It's not just about saying the truth, but it's understanding where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I, I'm, I'm not pretending that's easy. Yeah, I'm saying, but at the end of the day, because you, you're saying leave right. them. Well, have I, you ever come back the next day and say, have you thought about this? Now come to the conclusion. I have the luxury of not teaching theology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I teach, for example, Old Testament law. Right. When I'm teaching the Old Testament law, how do we, I think you said in one of the class, how do you use Old Testament law? Right. And I have that tendency to, at the end, I want to bring it, wrap it up, because I can yeah. get through material, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Next class, i got to move on. Move on yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and so... As, as an educator, I feel, that if I get them critically thinking about the topic, that was my goal, and I've succeeded. It, I can't make them a bunch of mini-me's. I, I really can't. And so, I'm... I'm careful ground here, but I'm not about indoctrination. I'm, I'm about education, right? Theology, especially within this kind of context, there's a balance there that I recognize, and I don't know how to play that out, so I'm very eager to hear if you have ideas. Yeah, because I know as a theologian, or in the biblical studies, I right. think orthodoxy is key. Right. And so if you have people in there with the heterodox ideas, I mean, I'm assuming that part of my role is to, here's orthodoxy. Um, I, I think the position, I, I'd probably engage in the more, these kinds of engaged conversations on topics that were allowed variants within my religious tradition, yeah. as opposed to things that have been firmly established as a heresy versus yeah. orthodox. I'd probably save the discussions for, for things that were legitimate, still debatable things that wouldn't interfere with calling each other brother. Yeah. <laughs> Even though, I mean, we push for orthodoxy, or at least we encourage, but even, for example, when I talk about multi-ethnic churches, you know, we need to uh, uh, urge our students to think about uh, inclusivity and diversity when they plan churches, for example. I mean, that's biblical, but how, how difficult it is sometimes for some students to go into that direction, you know, because I mean, they really want to say, I feel more comfortable in dealing with people of my own kind, you know? And, uh, I mean, is that biblical? Yes, yeah, but, you know, the Bible encouraged diversity, right? Uh, so how we can do that? It's, it's how could you can reconcile this? It's, it's so difficult sometimes, you know? At least I found that. Yeah. I, 
boy, I'm getting outside my terrain very quickly, but I, I think theology is best done within community, mm-hmm. right? That, that's, it's that open civil discourse which God honors and brings us together, I think. So I, I think, again, we're trying to model what it is that we want to create. Yeah, I disagree with that. I, I mean, I understand that concept. Uh, it's just as an educator, for me, sometimes it's like, okay, at the end of the day, this is an area of the text, the Old Testament gets pushed aside. Yeah. Uh, and so I want my, because I, I see it on Facebook, you know, I, I'm going on Facebook, and you see all these erroneous arguments, you're like, I, I can't let my students walk out of class right. and spew this stuff online, you know. Right. Uh, they need to understand that this is how you interpret because I also teach hermeneutics, and so it's kind of proper interpretation. So I'm struggling with exactly how to go from that open dialogue, but yet still pushing them in a direction. And I, I personally, in, in biblical studies, indoctrination, maybe that's a strong term, but I definitely want them to come to some conclusions that, again, would be orthodox. If, if we fully believe in the strength of our position, perhaps the path is through critical thinking. And so what we want to get them to, the next step, is that critical thinking step. And that would surely cause them to reject the heresies and embrace the orthodoxy. We would hope. A little sarcasm here. I just <laughs> 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 Okay, um, so the next topic was presentations motivate learning. Um, one of the things that I try to do, especially at the beginning of the semester and for certain classes sprinkled through, throughout, and I think this is kind of easy for me, um, not for me, but because of the stuff I teach, it's so awesome, um, that, and most of my students are pre-med, so if I can talk to them about an interesting disease then and take it to this level of this clinical aspect, um, application, then they're immediately more on board than if we're just talking about the pathway. They don't care so much necessarily about that. But then I'll pick usually something that's new out in the news. Like this year, Jonathan and I are teaching a cell molecular lab and the NIH just came out with a should, what kind of funding should we do for chimeras and added uh, a public forum. You can talk about this. So we presented that to our class and so it leads to this interesting discussion um, and kind of, I feel like this is my one-time sale of my class. This class is awesome, you should care. Um, so I try to do that in um, the beginning and make it relative to them or relevant to them. Um, and then one of the things that I do, I don't know how effective it is, I think sometimes they think I'm just a little lame, um, is I'll bring in a silly <laughs> pop culture reference. Um, like that. There was one this week where it's poisonous mushrooms. We were talking about the effect on one of these enzymes. And so I talked to them about Michael Scott in the office and he's doing something. And so I think those little snippets, they it helps them to remember because it's a silly reference um, or to tell a story. Sherry does this really well where she tells stories in her class and it engages them. Um, so I think those kinds of things help them learn because you're making the topic instead of more mundane, it's more interesting. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily how a presentation motivates the learning, but one of the things that um, my former mentor um, at Maryville College did that I loved for his forensic science class, and I t- taught it for um, a semester or a, a session, um, is he actually had them, it was a non-science majors course, and what he had them do is whatever their major was, their project for that class was based on their major and relating it to forensic science. So it was kind of, they were owning it. Um, so making it very relevant to what they were doing rather than, oh, I'll have to take that non-science majors course. Um, and I had a student, it was beautiful. She was an English major. And so what she did is wrote a short story about this crime that occurred. And she included all the science in it. And it was a beautiful example of how you can motivate them to do some really interesting work in something that you care about by bringing in something that they care about. Um, so even in um, core classes and things like that. Um, so any other comments on things that you do to make them want to learn more stuff? provides feedback that promotes learning. Um, and I'm just giving examples. This is something that on our laboratory notebook, um, Dr. Freak told me this very early on, um, which is um, 
one of the things that he'll do in his class, and I do it now too, is they'll turn in an assignment very early on, maybe with, for this lab notebook, they keep one the entire semester written in chunks, essentially. Um, but unfortunately what will happen sometimes if you collect it just for one time and that they've collected this, this information for the whole semester, they could have been doing it wrong the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so if you take it up early and not even, I give them guidelines and it's probably two pages of guidelines on what they're supposed to do. Um, but then I go back and the first time, as long as they've made an attempt to follow what I asked them to do, they pretty much get the full credit. Um, and we just write and write and write and make comments on it. So it really is that first assessment is really for them um, so that they know next time this is what I'm looking for. So you didn't quite understand what I wanted here, but next time you know. Um, and then I'm terrible at writing rubrics, but I'm, I'm beginning to convert to, yes, I understand they're important. Um, and so one of the things that I've done is come up with a rubric for some of my classes, and this is just one section of it, but I've broken it down into what I'm wanting them to say uh, or what I'm wanting them to be able to do um, for points. And then I gave them examples of this is a really good one and this is a terrible one. So I'm looking for this, not this at the bottom. Um, and I think for some of them that's helpful to see, okay, I don't, what's a clear and concise purpose? Um, so if you give them a, an example of them, I think that's helpful. And then another thing that um, Jonathan and I do in the um, cell molecular lab is they, they design their own experiment um, with our help. And they present it twice. They present it in written form and in oral presentation as a group. And unfortunately, if you have them do them both, so you turn in the paper with your presentation, there's a possibility they messed it up twice. Mm -hmm. When they present it to you orally, it's wrong. And they wrote it up, too, and it's wrong there, too. So there's a possibility for these two major assignments, they missed it twice. So what we have them do now is do one of them first, and we give them feedback on that one. So for instance, this semester, they'll turn in their paper first, and we'll go through it and give them comments so that before they actually do the oral presentation, they've had time to come and ask us what went wrong or to fix it um, if there's a major issue. And I think that helps um, so that they're learning and that our feedback is actually helpful. Um, are there any things that anyone else does that helps in this aspect. I know you guys do great things. You know, as much of a pain as the rubrics are, oh, that's yeah. probably <laughs> been the yeah. single most important thing I've done in a lot of my classes recently, yeah. particularly giving them the rubrics ahead, ahead of, time. of time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mine are posted on Moodle, so mm -hmm. yeah. It, it gives them a, a way of self-assessment mm -hmm. to know, okay, this is what I'm looking for, and it makes all the difference. The more detailed it is, the better their assignments are. It's as Absolutely. simple as that. Absolutely. Is, are you doing freshman classes? Mm -hmm. Are you talking freshman classes? No, this, these two are junior, senior level classes. Because okay. yeah. I use rubrics in well, kind of. freshman classes, and they don't look at them. I, th I think partially that may be because they don't quite know what the rubric is. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you spend a little time at the very beginning saying, okay, here's how I'm going to grade you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> well, you, you can force them to grade themselves. So as part, yeah, when they turn yeah, in the absolutely. assignment, they have to actually turn in the rubric mm -hmm. and where they've scored themselves on each of the issues. And then you can tell them what the real score is. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. With our clinical um, stuff, we have them hand in a, a assignment that's just for feedback, that's all mm -hmm. scored. They give it to us, and I used the rubric, and some of my peers didn't, but I did. I used the rubric and I said, if this was for grade, this is what you'd get. Mm -hmm. And I got back, wow, you were really harsh. I'm like, well, that's not for grade. Yeah. And <laughs> you know yeah. what to fix. Yeah, you know so, and then when I get the, you know, they get 90s and do really well Absolutely. on their graded stuff because they know and I can point it out on exactly on the rubric what you did. So it, it makes it very objective. It's not, well, you just don't like me. Yeah, I, I like you fine, or that doesn't matter. Yeah. This is what the rubric says. Sometimes I've tried with um, kind of, I don't know, 50-50 success, I guess. Um, I've actually had them evaluate each other. That's interesting, especially if, if you give them a rubric too, because you'll have the, at least I've had the students that are, wow, that's way more harsh than I would have been. Mm -hmm. And then I have the students, they don't want to be mean to their friend, and so it's really, okay, you're a little too nice. So I don't know, there's probably a better way to do that, but that's something I've tried um, in the past too. And definitely, I think when they self-assess themselves, mm -hmm. they're 
they tend to be more honest about yes, it. Yes, absolutely. It, it can be a pain to organize, but if you can do blind review, so if you take the name off mm -hmm. the assignments, mm -hmm. and, and the reviewer is also not revealed, right. you get a little bit more honest feedback, I think. Right, absolutely. All right, so this, this one, I think we've kind of talked about these things in other categories too, um, but acknowledges questions and suggests resources. I'm all the time asking them if you have a question, does anybody have a question on this? But what I've found is that, like I said, we're, we're moving along, and sometimes I think they just haven't quite had long enough to think about what their question actually is. So I'm trying something new this semester um, based on one of the se sessions that I went to in um, our um, fall meetings. And um, it was having them reflect at the very end. And I'll say I've had limited, I've not been fully successful with this yet, so I have to optimize this. Um, so if you all have suggestions, I would very much appreciate it. So I came in with post-its. And so that was my thing. So at the end of class, you're going to get a post-it note. And I want you to go back through and kind of ask me questions. And I think part of this is it's just not enough time necessarily. They still haven't had time to think through everything. But I, at least it was a start. And I will say in the beginning, it was very successful. And then it turned into, okay, we're just going to be done two minutes early or three minutes early. And so I have to find a better way to make this work. Um, but in the beginning, they were asking really good questions in the next class, I would start with, okay, here are the questions that we had, um, and let's try to clarify them. Or for more lengthy ones that were not really relevant, I mean, they're relevant, but very indirectly to what we're covering, I send an email link out to everyone that, okay, here's how this is actually done, and here's the link if you're interested in it. So I've tried those things, but if anybody has suggestions on other things that you've tried um, in this area. I've never tried thing. this, but I've, I've heard this just through education, like if you make them, um, if they have to read the chapter first, mm -hmm. and then they have their own post-it note at right. home, and come in and just slap it on the board at the beginning of class, right. as they're coming in, and then the professor just pops it off and says, okay, somebody had this question, let me talk about it. That's a great idea too, yeah. I've tried this in Capstone with reading assignments so if they I stole this from Sarah Schlosser actually <laughs> but she calls them IQ posts um, every reading assignment we have they we have a Moodle forum where they post one idea take that they took away from the reading and then one question mm -hmm. an idea and a question mm -hmm. and so those are those are it's required actually a small part of the grade in the class um, but they the questions are there for all the classmates to read through and I'll have different people sort of assigned to help lead discussions, but they can go back and sort of um, tailor tailor their discussion and try to address common questions that, that come up uh, in that way. So they're doing it at home on their own time, but everybody's sort of coming into class with, with a question already. Right. Yeah, that's a good idea. It works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts? I've done I give them a quiz every beginning of every class and mm -hmm. I tell them if they have a question, if it's a good question they can get a, they can ask the question instead of take the quiz. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, like that. <laughs> I don't always get good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do you tell them that's a bad question, here's the quiz? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I think they just didn't want to take the quiz so they just jotted something down I would, but usually they do come up with something that I mean, they have to put in words what they didn't understand yeah. that would keep them from doing well on the quiz. So, yeah, it's not full group. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, one of the other categories is shows interest in students and their learning. Here, I think, uh, and I intentionally did this, but um, relationships are what matter because um, I think they feel that you're more invested in them if they truly feel like you care about them. Um, and that all comes from relationships. Um, so I think this goes back to some of the points that we've made before, like attitude. How do you respond to the questions that they do ask? Um, do they feel humiliated when you've asked the questions? Um, but then also, I think part of this, and I'm not always, um, um, I don't always do this, but I try to, especially if they have an exam coming up, um, even if it's an, in, at an inconvenient time. Now, I tell them 
that I might not be awake at two o'clock in the morning when they have their question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but every once in a while, I do wake up at four. And so if it was a good question, and then sometimes I will respond to that email at this crazy hour. Um, but I think those two, they feel like, okay, you really do care because Okay, you responded to that at this weird time. And like I said, I don't always do it. There are times when I'm frustrated of, really, you're emailing me at midnight and the exam's at 8 o'clock. Um, but I do try to, when I can, even in the inconvenient time, to respond um, to questions. Um, so, anyway, other thoughts on that? But I do think here relationships are key. So office time, them feeling welcome to come in your office is important. Do you do that in large classes or small classes? Which one? The, the relationship relationship. Oh, relationship. yeah. I think, well, most of my classes, I'll be honest with you, I teach mostly upper-level courses, so my classes are inherently, I don't have 200 students yeah. in my class. I have 15, 14 right now in my class, so that's easy for me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think it's interesting to me, too, the dynamic when I've had the student one time, the first class, they're a little bit more, mm -hmm. but then by the time I've had them in the second class, there's just a different dynamic already. Um, and most of mine, I see them multiple times um, because they have to take me in the sequence. <laughs> They're stuck with me. Um, so, yeah, if the, heart, the larger classes, I don't, Trevor, you're, you, you're an expert at large classes. Yeah, I was just thinking about, I, it always amazes me, the, the personality of each class is so different. I'm talk, I teach either these 120 or 200 section psychology courses. And from semester to semester, it just feels so dramatically different. And I don't know how to predict it. Mm -hmm. But I know how delicate of a relationship it is. It's so, you know, you can just take one event to turn the crowd against me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it takes me weeks to recover. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to be careful about the things I say. And so I, I don't think about the relationship to each individual person, but I do think about my relationship to the class and the... Uh, the tone that I've kind of established. So I think that's where I think when I get the mm -hmm. bigger classes. All right, then my favorite, critical thinking. I think one, you have to tell them that they're thinking critically about something sometimes, because they don't always know that that's what they're doing. Um, and I'm just gonna give an example that I've, I've put pictures up just for fun for me, because I think it's cool stuff. But one of mine is I just happened to find this textbook that is phenomenal. and so the traditional textbooks that we have for these concepts, you get this. So it's a cartoon. And this is how this thing works, by this cartoon. But there's very little context for how did they get to the cartoon. It's just this is the way it works. That's not a lot of critical thinking. That's memorization. That's how it works. Um, and even when I took some of my courses in graduate school, that's the text that we use. It was just this is how it happens, matter of fact. But this new textbook that I'm using, it's this is what the experiment was and that got us to this and so they have to think through and Dr. Cornett's thinking okay that's a footprint <laughs> but um, they have to think through how did that get us to this and we actually go through each of the lanes and what does this mean and why is that important and how did it get us to that point and so it kind of helps to tie in the loose ends for why we got to the cartoon rather than just giving the cartoon. And I think that's helpful for some of them. The other thing that I, I try to, to change things that I felt like maybe I wasn't as good at when I went from undergraduate to graduate school, where was I? Where did I feel less prepared? And one of the places that I felt less prepared was in reading the primary literature. And so this helps them to be able to read the primary literature too because sometimes it gets so technical that they just... I, I'm just done before I even start. But once they've seen some of these, oh, okay, this is just this other experiment. Oh, that makes sense. And I know how to go through it. And then once we do this, then they take it to this next level, which looks very similar, but there's actually a, a big difference between that picture that I showed you and this one. And so then I say, okay, now what did that tell us before? And then how is this different? And so they're, they're, they're taking it to the next step. So I've told them how it works and how this experiment got them to this cartoon. And then we apply it again because that experiment comes back again for a different reason. Um, and so I think for me what helped was finding a good reference material. Um, so it's worked really well in that class. Um, and then in our classes too, we also have them design and perform their own experiments. So they have to think through because they're troubleshooting the entire time. 
because I think they, it's funny to us in retrospect when they come to us now and because I was the same way when I was a student. I thought, oh, okay, well, that's just one gel. That should take me about two hours to do that and I'll be done with the whole semester. And we kind of, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> you're going to mess it up three days. No, we don't really say that, but I'm like, okay, the first time it usually doesn't work beautifully and you've got to troubleshoot and optimize it. What we've done in the past in these classes where we're building you up to the, this ability to do this, those were designed to work. <laughs> They're not supposed to fail. <laughs> these you have to make work. You've got to optimize it to get what you want. Um, so they do really have to go through that process of, okay, this, this is kind of good. How can we make it better? What went wrong or how could we optimize this? And so in ours, I think this works really well for that. Um, and then Trevor. So the way that I, I deal with some of the critical thinking is in the midst of these kinds of groups is I, uh, I do want them to start hearing the internal contradictions, but it's, it's, you've got to do it gently. You, you do it too harshly, right, and now they're going to reject what's going on. And instead, I'm not trying to tear apart their argument. I sometimes take the guys that I'm trying to make your argument better, right? Let's think about, okay, if there's an internal conflict there, conflict here, how do you fix that? Now, maybe it can't be fixed. But, but, but they'll think their way through it. So I don't approach it as I'm an enemy to your approach. I'm just trying to make this a better argument. So how do we fix this internal contradiction? Um, I get them to I acknowledge the struggle of dealing with those, and I, I help them brainstorm potential solutions. Um, I, especially when we've got two controversial positions that are out there, I help them to bring the conversation up one level by focusing on final outcomes. This has been one of the most powerful techniques I think I use when we're, we're talking about controversial issues, and I need a kind of a sense of safety. So, for example, maybe the conversation is about abortion, and go back to the whole Democrats versus Republican approach, where, where from a Republican approach, it's like you know, let's let's, this, these are stereotypes, but we're we're trying to protect the sanctity of life, and we we want all abortions to be illegal, and and people shouldn't do them. And then, um, be, because we care about life, and then the Democrat approach, well, we also care about the woman's choice, and we don't think she should be forced into a situation against their will. And so we, we have that autonomy, which God gives each of us, uh, as something that's very, very important to us. So if you try to deal with the argument on that level, it's not resolvable. There's no common ground at that level. What's interesting is, both Republicans and Democrats are for fewer abortions. Both would love to see a decrease in the number of abortions that occur. It's just how they would go about it is somewhat different. Like Republicans want to, to be illegal so there would be fewer abortions. Democrats would like there to be more social support systems for pregnant women, more, more funding for health care, so it would be make, make it less likely that a person would choose to have an abortion. So if we can change the conversation to, if we can all agree that we want there to be fewer abortions, what are methods that work best to do that, that we can both agree upon? So when you go up to that higher level, get them to get out of the zone of the conflict, but to go, okay, what, what is your ultimate goal? Well, my ultimate goal is I, I don't want there to be as many abortions, or I don't want there to be any abortions, or something like that. Okay, well, how do we get to that place? And what would it look like from this perspective, and what would it look like from this perspective, and where would that merge? So again, I'm trying to get them to that, that different place in their discourse. Um, I also, uh, I don't allow them to oversimplify positions. I, I call these bumper sticker arguments, especially in this political season. We think we can articulate exactly how we feel about the other candidate <laughs> by a bumper sticker on our car, right? And I, I try to say, how many of you have ever changed your mind about your political affiliation based on a bumper sticker on the back of a car? It doesn't, th those, those little cute little sayings never cause anyone to reconsider their position. It's really a point of group membership. It gets you, oh yeah, they're one of the team. They're on my side of this, right? So it's, it's, it's team identity. You might as well put an Auburn sticker on the back of your car. It's, it's the same basic thing. You're trying to say, hey, I want my team to rally around me. It's not about convincing other people about your argument. So anytime arguments are simplified, there's problems that, are, that occur. And so I don't let them simplify the opponent's position. And I certainly don't let them simplify even their own position. I say, okay, let's, let's articulate that position as best as we can. 
um, and so much so that you can get a defense uh, for, for the other side. And again, I think that promotes the critical thinking. I did the same kind of thing, or similar to that, in one of my, um, when I taught a non-science class, um, a biotech class, we looked at um, stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, and I tried this one time, and I think it worked really well. I uh, just randomly assigned them, you are a clergyman in the Catholic Church. What is your perspective? And then they came back to me, well, at a certain ones, because I made them more vague, that there's not necessarily a position, but I tried to have them pick a position, and it couldn't necessarily be their own. Um, and by having them draw out of the hat, um, they told me in, in reflections that the hardest thing they had to do for several of them, they picked the position that was not their own, was to argue the other side and argue it believably. Um, because that's what I forced them to do. You're debating and you have to convince, this, convince us we're going to decide what we're going to do about stem cell research. You have to convince us which way to go. Um, and we judged them. There was a panel of us that kind of judged the debate, and they did a great job. But some of them said that was the hardest thing they had to do was to argue the other side believably. Um, I don't let them get away with caricatures of the other position, and it's so easy to do. It's so natural. We've been trained to just kind of blurt out the other position and how stupid it is. Mm -hmm. And I say you, you can't do it that way. It's cheap. So. The other thing I do a lot of times is I'll play devil's advocate, but I usually preface at the beginning of class. I'm not going to tell you because I'm the same. I definitely do not want them to. I don't want to sway their decision based on what I believe because, I don't, anyway, I don't want them to have an opinion because I have that opinion. I want them to think and come up with their own opinion. And so I will tell them at some point, okay, I'm, I play devil's advocate a lot. So just to let you know, don't hate me if you don't like the comment that I'm making. Um, and then I'll ask some other, well, what about this? In this situation, would this be better than this other situation? So, um, anyway, that, that's worked well in the past, too, to kind of, because I think sometimes they say what they think we, that we want to hear, um, what we think the right answer is, and they sometimes go that way rather than thinking through necessarily all the ramifications of it. Um, so, and I tell them, I've told them, of situations where I'm conflicted. I don't have an answer to this because I can see this perspective and I can see this perspective. And if you ask me on different days, I may be on one side of the fence or the other because I'm conflicted about this. I don't know what the right answer is. And I think that helps them to, to know that sometimes there are gray areas and it's hard to have a yes or no answer to a question. And having this discussion in front of them, I think the debrief is important because this can be an emotional experience for our students and have, having them articulate how hard it was mm -hmm. for them to take that other position and, and how conflicted they were, but, but maybe they'll volunteer something, but I never thought about it that way exactly. before or exactly. something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that really gets to what we're trying to do. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Critical thinking? All right, I think that's all we have. I just have one question. Yep. Does it ever concern you that a lot of students go into college having a solid faith and that by making them argue against what they believe that you're rattling that, that you're weakening that faith, and then when they go forward, they're not so sure anymore? That would bother me. I, I don't know. I mean, there has to be a right and a wrong, and nowadays a lot of ethics, schools of ethics are saying, well, there is no right or wrong. But there is. So if you shake that, I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm comfortable with that. Carol and I have done s workshops where we've talked about some of these issues. We, if we create a bubble where their view is not challenged, okay, they're safe here. But as soon as they get outside of here, it falls apart quickly. I would argue they really didn't come with a solid faith if it's so easily disturbed when we ask some of these questions. I think we, we're trying to, my goal is at the end of the process that they have a stronger faith. Now if we just leave them with questions, we haven't gone far enough, I think. But I think it's equally dangerous just to give them a bunch of answers and, and that's what they hold on to. I, I want them to reason their way through and come up with the orthodoxy 
that I, I feel confident would defend itself when it gets to the end of the process. That, that, that's my hope. Is that easy to do? No. Seminaries are famous for taking away people's faith from them, right? Mm -hmm. Because you find out that what if Paul really didn't write Second Timothy and <laughs> then your world starts falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you're, you're ch challenged on those kinds of issues. Um, I'm not saying it's easy, and there's risk, and I'm not sure we have enough um, safety nets in place. It's too easy, as big as we've become, for when we start pushing a little bit, that the person just kind of disappears, and they, we don't have the relationship with them to save them. That's I, my greatest fear, right? That I, I, I poke a little bit to encourage, but some of them I help, but some of them disappear that I no longer engage in that conversation with. But I would argue that if they're going to disappear in that, then once they leave Lee, then the conflict that's out there would also cause them to lose their faith. So I don't think, I think that we challenging them early um, and trying to be their safety net maybe will help them to own their faith instead of their faith being their parents. That's what I tell my students all the time. I don't want you to have your parents' faith. I want you to have your faith, right? And so I try to push them enough to make them question their faith to make sure that it's theirs. I think modeling is such a huge part of it because if they see that we can have a strong faith and we model that strong faith at the same time that we're struggling with these questions, they recognize, oh, wow, wait a second. I, I can struggle with this and I can still be a person of faith at the same time. That's, that's a big deal. A lot of times we don't have models. We see... When we talk about evolution, for example, I know that's a class that you teach too, um, we, we have this struggle of um, uh, do, do, do you believe in a 24-hour, seven-day theory of creation? Do you believe that God created the universe over millions of years? Uh, do you believe that it's a result of chance um, accident? Those are three options, and I do little clicker questions on people on that. Uh, here are incoming students. Slightly over half believe that God created over millions of years. Uh, the vast remainder believe that it was the 24-7 day type series. And I say, listen, my, my job is to not change your mind. I'm not trying to get you from believing in the 24-7 to it happened over a million years. But here's my fear. A lot of people think when they get confronted with evidence that's in biology or geology, what the case is, they go right from their position of 24-7 to its chance and God's not real. They don't recognize that there's a lot of devoted Christians that can be in that middle category and not see a conflict between science and faith. So giving them that option, even without trying to persuade them, they need to believe that option. But just knowing that there is an option that's in there, that if your faith is challenged, doesn't mean that you have to leave the faith. This actually happened to me yesterday. I had a student come in and say, I can't reconcile these. I feel like I'm going through a deconversion. I need, I need you to help me. So, I mean, I, I think they're struggling with it. And I think that us standing there and helping them and modeling in front of them that, hey, we can have these different opinions and it's all of this, then I think that that helps them. And I think that's what we're for. I think that's the purpose of us. Yeah, yes. I, I think, I think uh, in convocation, uh, uh, Dr. Rice is, uh, is such a wonderful sermon. I don't know how many of you are able to hear, but he was basically saying it's okay to have doubts. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I mean, sometimes we try to, uh, you know, kind of form uh, uh, students who are very dogmatic. You know, you know, one one size fits all everything. You know, but it doesn't that way. I think we really need to encourage students to think and. And uh, I mean, I mean, all of you went through this stuff. And I'm sure where, where we are right now is because we went through a process, a journey, and we still struggle in some areas and asking questions. We're still asking some questions, you know. And still, sometimes they really want us to uh, respond uh, uh, their questions in a way that is is very fixed and very dogmatic, very scientific. You know, you know, you know, many of you are scientists and. I have professor colleagues who went to some schools like Wheaton College, wonderful school. I was talking to Jerome Boone. I said, Ronaldo, at Wheaton, they taught, me, they taught me hermeneutics in a fixed way. You know, now I'm, I, I hear your voice as a Hispanic. I like to hear the voice of my brother, African American brothers and, and sisters. You know, other voices, it's not the way that they, they taught me at Wheaton. So just I can really learn the scripture in a different way. So 
you know, I, I think we really, it's okay to have questions and doubts sometimes, you know, but not to the point where I can lose my faith, but encourage, you know, hey, go keep, keep asking those questions, keep them finding an answer, and keeping the dialogue open, you know, but always not looking, obviously, aside from the God, from, from God's, from God's revelation, right? And that's where I think our attitude with them and how we have the atmosphere in the class is so important because they do feel comfortable enough to come to our office and say, I'm struggling with this and I need help. And for us to be able to sit there with them and say, it's okay to doubt. I've doubted many mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. um, it, and for them to be able to ask us, how do, you reckon, how do you reconcile this? How can you be a Christian and a scientist at the same time? Um, we get that on the lot. <laughs> um, so... I, I think the relationships help you to be able to help that student know it's okay to ask this question and still be a Christian. Um, so. I think Thank you all. Yeah. I just want to say one last thing, and that is this is my greatest concern of the 300-person religion classes because they don't have that personal relationship with the teacher to go in there and say, you said this, now explain that to me because <laughs> I've always heard this before. So they can talk to, to her, and they can, you know, they can ask this question about being a Christian and a, and a scientist. But if they're in a, if they're in an Old Testament class of 300 people, and something comes up that challenges their faith, it's not likely they'll go sit down with Brian and ask that question. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a problem. I always thought that. But anyway, that's why I'm going to call you yours. So thanks a lot for coming.